everybody. Um, I'm Janet Jones. I'm one of the co-chairs co of the Pervasive Monitoring Group. Uh, I've got Alex Brotman in the back. He is my other co-chair for the Pervasive Monitoring Group. And like to extend a special welcome to our guests and our uh, new members. So today we're going to talk about um, a more in-depth look at the keys under doormats. And Josh is going to be coming up in a few minutes to cover that. So I wanted to give you guys uh, just a quick two to three minute update um, on the pervasive monitoring special interest group. Uh, many of you that attended yesterday's session and today's session heard a little bit about our group and wanted to touch on why we were here and give you a brief update on our roadmap and some of the updates that we have coming up. So as you know, the ongoing disclosures about pervasive monitoring of email, voice, and other traffic remains an industry concern. It hasn't gone away since the disclosures of a couple of years ago. Uh, technical, technical communities still have interest in understanding uh, potential operational and security uh, customer measures that we are working on to help provide guidance in this space. Um, and also, a lot of the leading MOG members here um, have been publicly identified as specific targets. So we want to make sure that we are uh, working together as an industry to help solve some of these uh, technical and business problems. Um, so as I mentioned, there, there's an industry-coordinated response that's necessary for this. And as part of our mission, um, we have stated on the website, if, as you can go out and see, um, we strive to provide technically sound yet approachable advice on complex topics while providing a balanced perspective and coordinate our efforts in the industry. Also wanted to give a special thanks as well to our technical advisors. We have Joe, Dave, um, Richard, and John Levine that are also working with us on this. So we also want to thank them for their contributions as well as our pervasive monitoring uh, members as well. So just a bit of a, a step back here. Uh, right after the Snowden disclosures, uh, we came together as a group and formed the special interest group. And we first looked at what's our first step. So providing uh, guidance uh, for preventing against what we call passive attacks, we looked at adopting TLS, opportunistic TLS in the environment. Um, so we first published guidance for this, and these were just initial recommendations. These were not meant to be step-by-step -step guidance on how to actually do implementation, but some basic guidance for companies to go out and, and drive te technology adoption. We saw a significant uh, increase from 30% up to 80% TLS adoption uh, in the 2014 timeframe. And I want to thank the folks from Google and folks from uh, Facebook for providing these reports. And those folks are actually here today. So if you guys want to speak to that, thanks, Mike, for the, uh, the reporting. Um, it's very important for us to keep an eye on that because we want to make sure that we're not going down versus up. So a 50% increase is significant over a year's time frame, but we even want to drive that adoption up even higher. Um, after the uh, TLS recommendations paper, we actually put out uh, recommendations for how to get started on handling man-in-the-middle man attack scenarios. And this is something that, if you think about, uh, TLS um, handles more of the, the passive. This is more for the um, attacks where folks will be able to aggressively get um, in the middle and, and do damage. So we do have a couple of things that we are evaluating. Uh, the DNS second Dane, if you were in one of our previous talks earlier today, um, Victor covered information about this, but we do have um, another group within our special interest group that's working on evaluating a new protocol, SMTP strict transfer, transport security in coordination with the IETF. And one thing to mention is we're not doing this uh, based off of uh, just a small group that no one's welcome. It started off with a smaller group, and we wanted to try to evaluate different technology options that we could have to see if there was something else that we could uh, potentially adopt sooner than later. So by no means do we intend to be an island of our own. Um, as it may seem, we want to engage with everybody to make sure that we are um, being inclusive. A uh, quick update on the roadmap. Uh, we've published um, 
uh, two papers so far, the initial recommendations for TLS, the man in the middle, um, and then we recently did an endorsement um, for the MOG for keys under doormats, which Josh is going to talk about in just a couple minutes. Um, we do have under final recommendation, uh, under board review, our initial recommendations for using forward secrecy. Um, in the next couple months, we're going to be working on crypto isn't free, traffic analysis, and then our protocol work uh, we're looking to target in March. Um, so I do anticipate that we are going to be looking for other folks to be helping them with this roadmap. Let me introduce Josh. Josh is a senior cryptographer um, at Microsoft, and he's going to co cover our keys under doormats uh, report that was uh, talked about earlier today. Thanks, Josh. OK. Thank you very much, John. Am I on? OK, great. So uh, I talked this morning about this um, report with 15 authors, and I talked about our conclusions. I didn't talk about anything in the report other than the conclusions, and the idea is that this is an opportunity to talk about what's in the report, um, our rationale, our justification, uh, along with uh, what we conclude. So just a reminder, um, the, the high-level conclusions are that we really don't know how to provide law enforcement authorities with the access that they seek without substantially weakening internet security, which is not something we want to be playing with right now because you know, we've got, already got fingers in the dike and you know, don't start drilling other holes, please. Um, and further than that, we don't believe that this kind of exceptional access can be built within the current infrastructure with the current technology that we have. Um, yes, perhaps we could build a new internet that would provide law enforcement access and other things uh, that, that might be very good. Everything is authenticated, yay, that would be great. But that's not what we have to work with. So given these claims, I want to say a little bit about how and why we got there. But the first thing we have to do is talk about the ask from uh, law enforcement on this. And the problem is we've gotten very vague requirements. Um, they're a little bit narrower now, but we still don't have a good idea of what kind of access law enforcement seeks. Is it communications? Is it just communications? Probably not. Is it stored data? Just stored data? Probably not, but maybe that's good enough. Is it data that's held in the cloud, or is it data on a device we want? Is it, I mean, in some sense, of course, it's all of the above. But what are the real priorities here? We really would like to get some specificity before we try to look at what can be done and what can't be done. The next question is who should have access to this data, right? Is it the case that the ability to decrypt data should be held by some single global entity, some UN commission or, or other you know, central authority that everybody can go to and petition, you know, I need access because of this terrorist act? Probably not going to work very well. Uh, not with the world the way it is today. Maybe it's various um, national security agencies. Um, but if so, which ones? And how is it decided which national security agency gets access? Is it local law enforcement? And is it every, you know, just the FBI or every one of thousands of jurisdictions throughout the US alone? And you know, not, not to name other countries. Maybe it's not that at all. Maybe it's private sector's responsibility. Maybe it should be that the device manufacturers Whatever device you're using, whether it's a mobile device or it's a laptop or whatever it is, um, the device manufacturer should build in keys and be able to be subpoenaed or have warrants or, or something uh, issued to say, OK, now here's this data that at one point touched this device. It might not even be on the device anymore, but it came through this device at some point, so you should be able to, with your key, give us access to this data. Maybe it's the service providers, as, as data is flowing across their channels. Maybe the keys are, are held by them in some way. And how should that be done? Maybe 
it's specialized third parties in some sort. In, in some respects, I would prefer that at least the specialized third parties have um, securing keys um, as their, their mandate and a requirement rather than a, a company that's um, in the device manufacturer business and they're trying to shave off every penny of the device and oh, by the way, here's this very sensitive key that you should produce and hold on to and um, yeah, maybe you, know, you don't know that much about uh, internet security but you're gonna need to protect this key. And, and make it highly available at the same time. So, you know, specialized third parties maybe have a better chance, but we don't know. We haven't been given any of these requirements. So there's a lot of guesswork, and this, this makes it very hard to figure out what could be done or couldn't be done. We, we have a broad set of things that we really don't think can be done, and you know, it's, in, unless we get specific requirements, then it, it's, hard to, to be specific about our, our response. So there are some fundamental impediments that go along with all of these requirements, or all of these possibilities. And you know, I'll, I'll put them into three categories. One is there's an incompatibility with best practices. That um, the kinds of requirements that were be, being discussed here pretty much all are in opposition to the way we're trying to move to make uh, internet and communications more secure than they are today, not less secure. There's also an increase in complexity. Anytime you build in this new layer, you're adding complexity, and as I'll mention uh, uh, later, um, complexity is often regarded as the, an enemy to security. And there's the concentration of targets. When we have golden keys, whether they're hold, held by law enforcement agencies or private individuals um, or, or companies or wherever they are, they become prime targets. And um, if you have concentrated targets, you have a lot of risk and you've got to find good ways of managing that risk. And this is something you probably want to avoid, especially because these concentrated targets also have to be highly available. I'll, I'll say more about that later. So let me talk about um, these a little bit more and then I'll go into some depth in some scenarios. Um, current best practices, first of all, uh, uh, forward secrecy is something that we're rapidly moving towards and I'm gonna go into this a little bit as we go into our first scenario. But this is something that we are trying to build out throughout the web uh, every place we can and I simply do not know how to do the kind of key escrowing um, that seems to be necessary here in a way that's compatible with forward secrecy. Authenticated encryption is another related issue. We're trying to move more towards this. It has a lot of advantages and benefits. Um, and again, authenticated encryption with keys that are held by third parties uh, kind of, um, invalidates the whole authentication side of it. So uh, things do not work well there. Um, on the complexity side, well, I don't have to read them. You see the lists. You've seen these lists many times before. Um, you know the sorts of problems when you try to you know, build large systems. You know, the systems get broken. Um, there's a... Uh, a very interesting quote, um, probably should have put the uh, complexity quote here, but uh, let me put this quote. Since it's in the slides now, we'll, we'll do this quote first. Um, from uh, Admiral Winnefeld, the uh, Vice Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and you can read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll call your attention to this particular um, part of it. Um, it's, a it's taken within the context of a discussion, so it's a little awkward. But the, the key thing here is the, the claim that from, again, um, a, a Joint Chiefs of Staff Vice Chair saying, I would rather live on the side of secure networks and a harder problem for NSA Director Mike Rogers on the intelligence side than very vulnerable networks and an easy problem for Mike. Okay, this is something we um, we say all the time, it's nice to see people in, um, in the military and law enforcement who also you know, say similar things. 
So um, concentration of targets, um, once again, OPM comes up. You know, this is a case where a lot of government data for a lot of agencies is all held in one place. And you know, that place, wow, that's a, that, that's a target rich environment. You know, just go there and we saw what happened there and it was really bad. Um, do we really want to put everything into one central repository somewhere? Um, there's this apocryphal quote that um, Willie Sutton is said to have replied, although claims are he never actually said it. Um, but you know, it, it fits anyway, the question of you know, why he robbed banks, because that's where the money is. Why would you go after this spot? Well, if there is one spot that's got everybody's data, you, know, you can bet that spot is going to be a, a major target of attack. And we probably don't want that. Um, even if decryption is something that remains within the private sector, if the golden keys are kept within the private sector, I don't know how many people in the room would really feel like I want all the data on, uh, that I've ever um, generated or you know, millions and millions of people's data to be protected by a single key somewhere in a vault in Verizon or Apple or Microsoft somewhere. Yeah. I, I don't want that kind of concentration in the private sector any more than I want it in the public sector. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about scenarios that we, we covered um, in the report because this seemed like a good way to try to highlight some of the issues. And there are two scenarios that we focused on. One is um, communications data that's been encrypted and the other is stored data that's, that's been encrypted and how access uh, or availability of access to the data in these scenarios can cause problems. So. Um, the first thing I need to talk about is how um, encrypted communications have traditionally run. Um, and this is really what TLS used to do almost exclusively. Um, I'll talk about uh, TLS a little bit more. But, um, but the basic idea, and this, is, this predates TLS. This is the basic technology that's been used for decades as a way of encrypting data for transmission and sometimes even for storage. You have a message M that you want to encrypt with a key K. Now what you usually do is encrypt the message with this symmetric key and then encrypt the key that you use to encrypt the message with an asymmetric key. The reason is if you have some communication you want to use public key asymmetric encryption to transmit the information, but the public key operations are many orders of magnitude more expensive than the symmetric operations. So what you usually do is use a symmetric operation for your bulk encryption. The message, the, the, the data gets encrypted with the symmetric key, and then the asymmetric key is used to do the key transmission just the, the, the minimum that needs to be done with asymmetric. So once you have that, you transmit both the encrypted message, the encrypted with the symmetric key, and the encrypted key, the symmetric key encrypted with the recipient's asymmetric key. Okay? This is how TLS has worked for, for years, but TLS doesn't only do this. So I'm going to just give a quick advertisement for TLS because it, it's, there's a session coming up on this. TLS is one of the greatest security protocols ever built. And the reason is its agility. TLS used to use RC4 for 99.9% .9 of all traffic. We've moved off of RC4 for, for various reasons. We're using mostly AES. The move has been seamless. It's not like we had to shut down the internet and move everything to AES and then bring it back up with AES. Now um, we're moving to perfect forward secrecy in, um, in, in most, many cases, if not most, trying to get, get there. Again, we can do this within TLS kind of seamlessly. There's greater and greater adoption. 
you know, things are going well. Okay? So we have this mechanism that we're using. We've got TLS agility that we can do it with. It's great, but there's a problem. Um, that agencies thought it was a great idea years ago to say, okay, we have this mechanism, this is what we're doing. It's very easy to just say, well, as long as you're transmitting the key in some encrypted form that allows for decryption, why not also throw on there an encryption of the key um, that is targeted for some government access or, or trusted third-party access or some other place where you, this key will be effectively escrowed. So if a, anybody intercepts the, the transmission, they've got the encrypted message, they've got the key encrypted with the recipient public key, and they've got the message key encrypted with the golden escrow key of whatever escrow agent is being used here. This seemed to make sense. It's a very easy thing. It's just adding a little bit to each message. Doesn't seem like it would be that hard. Okay, can we do this? Well, there are problems. The first we've talked about a little bit already. It's whose golden key is being used here, right? Is there a single entity? If so, which one? Can you, you have multiple golden keys? Well, you could say, okay, we'll tack on a few. We'll tack on one for the NSA and one for GCHQ and one for this. And uh, this message, oh, it's going here, so we had need to tack on this key. Well, there's a lot of complexity now being added. But as long as you only put on a few keys, maybe. It, that's not that unreasonable. Um, people sometimes talk about split keys. It's not that hard to do where it was something, well, maybe the, the way to protect things is you have a piece of the key going here and a piece of the key going here, and only if these two agree, then they can um, somehow you know, get the message key and decrypt the message. It's doable. The policy of this is, is a nightmare. I don't know how to decide, okay, if we have um, you know, three members of the Security Council agree, then they can get this message. Or if we have 90% um, of the UN General Assembly nations, then they can get that. Or yeah, I, I don't know how to make that work on a political perspective. Technically, it's not that hard. But politically, it's, it's a nightmare, I think. The other problem, though, um, is that there's a fundamental weakness in this paradigm that we've used for decades of um, transmit encrypted message together with the key that encrypted that message. And that is an attacker can sit around and collect these pairs. Here's the encrypted message, here's the encrypted key. For years and years and years, from some entity that's doing a really good job of protecting security and they're, they're impenetrable and you're, you're, you're just collecting the encrypted data as it goes across some public channel. And then at one point, somebody makes a mistake, some vulnerability is, is made available, and the public key is broken. The, the, the corresponding private key is released in some way. And suddenly, with that one breach, all those past messages that have been collected for years and years are suddenly all vulnerable. They're all exposed. And with the, the number of breaks we've seen in the world, we've come to the conclusion that this isn't a really good idea. Because you know, to, to say it in a polite way, breaks happen. Um, and you know, we, we need to, instead of just trying to prevent them from ever happening, we also have to do some defense in depth and make it so that if they do happen, the damage is limited. So the world is moving towards what's called forward secrecy or sometimes perfect forward secrecy. And I won't go into the technical details. I think a lot of people here probably know the, the technical details very well. If not, you know, come talk to me later. But uh, the basic idea is that um, you use, instead of um, RSA encryption and decryption, you use Diffie-Hellman protocol, which actually predates RSA, and you generate a new ephemeral random um, session key for every session that you have. And at the, at the end of the session, you destroy the key, and you destroy the randomness that was used to generate the key. You still have things authenticated, but the keys are no longer available. 
So if somebody breaks a session, um, and, or bre breaks into um, your facility and gets your keys, then yes, they can get the messages that are going on until you, you discover this and close things up, but it's very limited duration. They can't get any past things. And in fact, they have to do more than that. Any attacks have to be real time. They can't be done offline. You have to effectively man in the middle the attacks. So while you have the broken key, you can play man in the middle until that's found. And that, that limits the damage. And I, I think there's general agreement this is a much better way to go. Problem is, it doesn't support this, this um, golden key model because the golden key is a long-term key that if it's compromised, a lot of things are compromised. Okay, um, another problem is authenticated encryption. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but um, this is something that's, um, that allows simultaneous confidentiality and authentication of any data that's being sent or stored. Um, but the problem is, if you give a third party access to a key that's not being used just for confidentiality, but also being used for authentication, then that third party has the ability to impersonate the sender. And now, this calls into question the whole authentication. There's this third party who has access to this. Did I really say this? It's, it used my key, but somebody else had my key. They had good reason to make it look like I said this. You know, is it really a signature? Is it the, there really any authentication anymore? So it, it undermines the whole authentication infrastructure that comes from using authenticated encryption. And there are a lot of benefits to using authenticated encryption, using a single key and putting the authentication and the confidentiality together in one, one basic step and doing it right. Okay, um, so I wanna move off of that to scenario number two, which is the scenario of a device which has encrypted data on it and some authority wants to be able to look at and see what, what the data is on this device. Um, now, one could postulate there's some sort of a regimen available that might uh, uh, enable one to look at a ca the d data on a capture device, but, but what would it actually look like? We do have some experience with things which do this sort of thing. We have localized private escrow systems. BitLocker is one example of things that, that do this, but you do see this sometimes within the corporate environment where a, a company says, hey, employees, you really need to back up your keys. We are the, the backup agent. If, if something is lost, you know, we at our corporate IT headquarters can recover your data um, if something happens to you or you forget or whatever. Th this is a sensible thing. Escrow in this context is not unreasonable and it, it's done. But we're talking about a different context here. Um, if the access keys are held by my corporation, it's not very coercive. This is part of my employment. I kind of want to do this. Um, uh, the, there's, the, the incentives are there for me to have my, my data backed up. But um, if we have a regimen where this is mandatory in some sense, then things get a lot harder. Um, if um, the keys um, are maintained by vendors, um, there has to be some sort of a process that um, th these third party vendors have, or, or not necessarily even third party, you know, maybe the device manufacturers have, uh, of basically dealing with these requests from a third party. So it's not internal to my company. I'm getting, oh, sorry, I lost my key. Here's my, my badge, here's my D, here's my, my manager's um, signature. Please you know, get my keys back. This is something coming in from some law enforcement entity in some small state somewhere saying, oh yeah, we need the key. How do we you know, authenticate that? We're getting it from lots of agencies. Um, there, there's difficult um, issues to, to resolve there. 
Um, there's also difficulty in verifying uh, possession of the device. Um, the way that this has been described is if I have captured, if I've, say, arrested somebody or, or um, through some sort of a warrant, searched somebody's home, and I have, uh, in law enforcement, I have the device, and I want the data on the device, then we've said, you know, maybe we want to, to build ways to make this happen. But we don't necessarily want it to be the case that you can get data if you don't have the device. These are, from a, a legal perspective, very different situations. And verifying that the requesting agent actually has the device, if we're doing this remotely from some central place, can be a challenge. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying I, I, I don't really know how to do it. I've looked at some possibilities. We all looked at some possibilities. We thought maybe this, maybe that. There might be some ways of doing this, but we, we just couldn't make anything really work very well. Um, on the other hand, maybe law enforcement has the keys. So it's, it's in your hands. You have the, the way of, doing, uh, of uh, accessing the data. You don't have to go off to a Verizon center or, or, or uh, um, go off to Google or somebody who you know, built a device or runs the network or whatever it is. It's all within law enforcement's hands. Well, some of the same problems still exist internally within law enforcement. Um, but that, th there are other problems that you get into now in how do the law enforcement keys get on the devices? If I'm the um, builder of the device, it's my key, I, I'm the manufacturer, then I can, uh, can have a good change for putting it in. But getting keys from law enforcement into devices creates problems. Um, it's also a problem to store um, these very sensitive keys in a way that provides broad access. This is sort of the high availability thing. We know how to take a key and lock it in a vault. We're pretty good at that. We can lock things in vaults. But if this is something that's got to be used 100 times a day, or maybe you know, thousands of times a day, then making it so that it can be used only for those exact cases where it's appropriate to use them and no others, and is never compromised in, in, in a way that makes it used in millions of ways, that gets very hard. Again, something we don't really know how to do. So, um, some general problems with this approach is whoever holds the access keys um, has to maintain some sort of a database or a master key of some sort, which becomes one of these concentrated targets. You have to be, have high availability. Updates become a huge problem. How do you update keys, update procedures? You, know, you, you need the kind of agility that TLS provides, and, and we don't know how to do this in an escrow environment. Um, another question is, what happens when one of these devices crosses a border, right? You can postulate something entirely within a country, entirely within the U.S., that's fine. But this is not the world we live in, right? You know, what happens if you've got an American design, Chinese-built mobile phone purchased in the U.K., used in Russia to call somebody in Syria, say? Exactly whose keys are in this device and whose keys are being you know, moved around? Who, who has the ability to decrypt this? I don't know. And these questions have to be answered before we deploy a system because the system is going to implement something that has answers to these questions, right? So this has to be figured out. Okay, so I've got another quote. As I said, maybe I should, should have stuck this in earlier from... Uh, former NSA director of research, um, which I'll call your attention to the standard phrase, complexity is the enemy of security. We're postulating something that is, adds a lot of complexity. We don't even know exactly what, what the requirements are here. Even if we did know them, there are a lot of requirements that we have to get right. Um, this is hard. And adding this complexity is going to make security a lot harder a lot weaker. Implementation also is hard, right? Um, basically, if you build a system that's designed 
to provide some sort of extraordinary access to some people. One little bug makes it available to lots of people, right? Perfection is not guaranteed. And I'll tell you a quick anecdote. When I was a graduate student, um, when I started out as a TA, um, TAs were given access to all the, the data of all the students in a class that they were the TA for. And they could go through and go through all the assignments and do all the grading they had to do. Um, but um, what, what happened was um, it was viewed that this was a little bit too broad, that it should be that they only get access to the students that they're grading papers for um, and, and nothing else. And there was a, a, um, a tool that was built that was called Make Me. And you could basically impersonate any student going through this Make Me tool and be that student for a little while and you know, do things. And now you know, make me this student, make me that student, go through. It was a royal pain. It was discovered very early on, though, that it had a bug. The best kept secret in the history of Yale, I think. Um, if you typed make me star, you had root access. You could just see everything and everybody. And every graduate student knew this and never let on because otherwise their lives would get harder. But this is the kind of thing. This was a mechanism that was designed to provide extraordinary access in a particular way. And one little bug suddenly gave you know, access way beyond what was ever anticipated. It was a small bug, but still survived for years and years. Nobody, no student wanted to tell the fact. I mean, I'm not telling the secret anymore because it's known now, but for years this was used. OK. Um, finally, competitive disadvantage is a big concern, right? US products that provide some sort of exceptional access um, give us a, a severe competitive disadvantage in, to, um, to the, those countries in competing with products from countries that don't have those mandates. Seems pretty simple, right? Why is it the case that I, if I'm living in Germany, say, would buy an American product that has CIA back doors when I can buy a German product that doesn't? Right? Pretty fundamental issue here. And getting some sort of broad international agreement where every country agrees to the same level of access seems kind of unlikely. OK, so I'm just, uh, I'm going to pretty much end here with a whole bunch of questions. And I, I don't even want to take the time to go through all these because I want to leave time for your questions. But um, the report has, at the end, uh, several dozen unanswered questions. I'll go through very quickly. Um, you know, won't even have time to read them. But they're, they're grouped into four categories here. There's scope questions, design questions, operation questions, um, evaluation questions. And there are things like, you know, um, does, do, would, would a mandate of some sort cover every use of encryption or some? Which ones? Um, do all platforms have to provide access to, to data or, or merely keys? You know, where are things? Um, they, these are also intended to be thought provokers. So these are sorts of things that you might look at and say, yeah, well, maybe we could do this or that and we can get some discussion going. Um, but um, here is the, the, the sorts of, of things you might want to ask. Um, you know, would, would user installed systems have to meet these um, exceptional requirements? Um, how about machine to machine systems? You might have systems with no user data whatsoever. You know, sensors that are sending data back and forth. Do they really need to escrow the keys if they're encrypting the sensor data because the, the, the information, the sensor information is encrypted? You know, you would think not. Uh, SCADA systems, controlled command kinds of things. Do you really need to? I don't know. But then, you know, you, if, if not, then you, you can hide all sorts of things from this. What, what sort of um, answers are there to the uh, cross-border kinds of issues? Um, you know, how can you uh, get um, access um, that, that 
preserve civil rights in some broad uh, case. There are lots of countries where encryption is really necessary to protect civil rights. Um, well, I guess maybe all countries you can argue that, but, but you know, people are d dying in some places because they're found out as having um, supported something against the government or just because of lifestyle issues, all sorts of things um, are the fundamental privacy, if they're violated, people die. Um, exceptions for research. You really need these if you're going to be able to do research, right? But this hasn't been talked about. Um, human rights again, um, anonymity. Should anonymity be banned? You know, do, do we need to require that every communication on the internet is authenticated and you know its source? Because that seems to be the case if you're going to have this kind of a regimen. Um, there are a bunch of design questions. Um, um, a lot of this comes down to cost benefit. A lot of it is really, you know, this is going to be really expensive to build. What sort of benefits are there? Um, reliability measures, how do you measure wh whether you've gotten success? Um, um, how do you actually transition? And what about legacy products? Do they just, is there some cutoff date when they get banned? Um, who gets to do these evaluations? Who gets to decide? Um, uh, this is just a question about um, whether the, the, the standards are open, whether they can be reviewed. Um, I don't know. Um, okay, um, there are a bunch of, well, I guess there are only a few more slides of questions, so maybe I'll, I'll go through a couple more, um, but I do want to leave time for your questions. So um, there's the whole supervision issue. You know, where, where is the compliance measured? Um, this, this is uh, um, a very hard thing to try to imagine. Um, is there some sort of global harmonization requirement? Um, you know, are there global standards required? And how would these be developed? Um, it, do you do this with you know, some sort of uh, international bodies, and, and how would you set these standards? Uh, would there be reference implementations? Um, I guess you'd want that. Who's going to build this? Um, is certification required before any product that uses encryption is sold anywhere? Does it have to go through this process in advance? And who would be the, the certifiers? Um, I do a lot of work in, in elections and voting, and let me, let me say you know, um, the test labs that do certification of voting equipment, it's not a pretty story. They, you know, they, they have not really done a very good job. It's, it, it's not a good myth. The, the way that it's been set up and the way that you would imagine it being set up here is anytime um, a company builds a, um, an election system that needs certification, they have to pay for the certification. They get to choose the lab that they pay to do the certification. Now, you can imagine that this is going to cause some problems. And it does. And it just, the systems become kind of a farce. Um, OK. Um, who would be liable if things go wrong? Um, and what happens when they do? When, when, when keys are revealed, what's the recovery procedure? Um, how many companies would withdraw from entire countries if this is the, the case? This has already happened in some cases. This is, again, a competitive question. Um, how do things change over time? If we set standards, what's the process for changing them? Um, what kind of sunset provisions are there? Um, what, what mechanism would there be in place of saying, this isn't working, we've got to stop it? What re requirements have we built there? Um, would we actually just kill the use of crypto entirely? This is too hard. This is kind of what happened before the export re uh, restrictions were eased that we were only allowed to export weak crypto, so everybody had weak crypto. It was too hard to do anything more. Well, we might just ruin security by saying crypto is too hard be because of these procedures. Um, and finally, 
how will the negative economic impacts be, be assessed when you're doing an evaluation of what are the positive benefits and what are the negatives? Um, you know, that, that's a big problem. So anyway, um, there's just a huge list of questions that come up that really need to be answered if you're going to do anything with this. And I welcome questions, discussion, rebuttals, anything you'd like to say. Mm -hmm.